Yeah. Good evening, friends. So we, we, I guess we can start. I would uh, like to welcome all the eminent participants uh, and our most esteemed friend and dear uh, esteemed guest and a dear friend, Roman Babushkin, for today's interview. And also Arunji, who will be uh, taking his interview. And dear friends, Karsten, uh, Dr. Katya Benek also has joined, I can see, and the people who are going to join in the future. First of all, I would like to apologize for this slight inconvenience today. We had to postpone the event uh, by one hour because our dear friend Roman is very busy because of the tough, challenging, and interesting times. And he has been really kind enough to spare time from his extremely busy schedule. So first of all, we would like to thank him and immense our sincere gratitude to him for joining us today. So, Roman, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank and you very much. Again, Thank you. Thank you. I'm indeed delighted to join you today. And I do sincerely apologize for this delay because we just uh, unexpectedly had a meeting in, in the ministry. So we, it, it, it came in a really, you know, sometimes in a on, on, in real time, you know, uh, regime. So I, I'm so sorry. Um, the Mufti J is here. No worries. No worries. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. So, and you agreed for this interview. Uh, so, once again, interesting times, challenging times, tough times, or exciting times. What should I say? Something of the old order seems to be collapsing, and a lot of things are happening which give us indications to what's going to happen in the next five years, maybe seven years, ten years. Definitely, you know, we see a lot of floating narratives about what's happening in Europe. You know, this Russia Ukraine crisis in the Western mainstream media, we hear a set of stories. Then we also try to find the truth, what is exactly happening there. So unfortunately, there is an acute dearth of the real uh, ground level sources about informing us what is uh, on, or what's happening over there. Then there is a question of uh, different stands uh, taken by various countries. India, as we know, is facing a lot of heat, uh, I would say, especially from the Western camp uh, about its stand. But uh, as we say that India has taken a neutral, I wouldn't say a neutral stand because the neutrality implies passivity. We are just being detached and we are being objective and very vibrant and very active in this crisis and uh, try to find the truth and do some real exercise uh, to establish peace. So then we have old friends, we have friends in the other part of the world also. So uh, India is just trying to balance out things and also uh, find peace in this whole uh, crisis. And this stand, uh, I would just like to uh, make a point here that this stand also comes from India's uh, uh, Vedantic uh, philosophy of being a detached of the observer and finding out the truth. So today we have a very interesting and a very uh, friendly guest here today with us, uh, Mr. Roman Babushkin, who is the BCM of Russian Embassy in India. And uh, we'll have many interesting questions and uh, very, I would say, you know, queries, interesting queries about what's happening. And he's here with us now. He's been uh, kind enough to spare time and agree to this interview. So, uh, yes, that's uh, his uh, uh, in introduction. And then we have a very important guest here today, Mr. Arun Anand, who will be interviewing Roman Babushkin. Arun Anandji is also a dear friend, and he brings uh, with him a very, I would say, vast experience in journalism, think tank world, the strategy, and a very diverse range of topics, I must say. He is a consulting editor with Network 18 and also columnist with First Post News 18, News 18. And he has been a very passionate observer, not only of the geopolitical events, but also of things happening at the grassroots in India, the political changes, social changes. So uh, from now, I, from here, I just hand it over to Arun Anandji. And uh, uh, please, yeah, you can begin the interview. We are here, waiting here to listen to Roman as very patient you know, audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinavji, for uh, such kind words. Uh, and I'll straight uh, forward, get on with, you know, it's basically not like a typical interview. I think we'll move ahead kind of a conversation. So, Abhinavji, wherever you, you think, you know, you want to chip in uh, or if there is yeah, anybody who, I, I... yeah, so please uh, feel free. And then, uh, uh, you know, I think Broadly, as you said, the Vedantic philosophy also is uh, tells us basically we can agree to disagree on, uh, you know, yes. uh, that's that's the essence of, uh, uh, you know, moving ahead together. So we can agree to disagree Certainly. on a lot of things and there are different ways of looking at things. So, uh, 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 Mr. Ruban, 
the first thing which I want to know is uh, that how early you see the will straightforward get about you know the Russian Ukrainian uh, uh, conflict. Uh, how early you see the war with Ukraine coming to an end? Is there any specific time frame, and is it different? Uh, the way things are panning out is it different from with the earlier assessments, uh, which was made by you know the Russian establishment. That or, or in other words, has it went too far, too long, as many of the observers in the West are saying? First of all, it's a big barrier. Namaste. Jo. अब की दिलचस्पी है इस मामले में यह हमारे लिए बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है जी तो हम कुछ बातचीत करेंगे एंड आई टोटली एग्री दैट वेल आई वुड रियली प्रेफर टू हैव सम कन्वर्सेशन एंड डायलॉग सो वेल आई परसीव इट नॉट जस्ट एन इंटरव्यू बट कोर्स वेल वी आर ऑल फॉलोइंग द न्यूज एंड दैट इज इंपॉर्टेंट दैट एक्चुअली द यू नो वेल ओपिनियन कम्स फ्रॉम यू नो वेल मेनी साइड्स नॉट जस्ट वेल वन साइड you know that you have some you know really balanced approach that is uh, something uh, um, you know um, if uh, we have to agree to, to disagree so well, anyway so you you have to listen to each other that is something which is missing when it comes to the uh, conversation between russia and west currently so and um, mm, that's again makes us you know uh, feel very you know uh, involved here in the process of discussion with the uh, with uh, the indian side and uh, we we feel the real interest from the indian side to get into details and to, i also agree with abhinav that uh, actually it is not a neutrality this is a balanced approach of the uh, indian side which takes into consider consideration all the aspects of, uh, of the meaning and that explains the uh, positions which uh, india is taking on um, the international arena in the united nations in the Security Council and others. So, uh, when, uh, when we come to your first question about the how long does it take? So, of course, uh, uh, we wish it, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, well, ends uh, as early as possible. Of course, uh, well, and in fact, we never wanted this uh, conflict to happen. So, and uh, uh, in order to uh, realize this uh, conflict uh, uh, from today's perspective, of course, we need to get into into some history because actually it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen right just in February. So uh, it was preceded by the sequence of events started with the um, with the anti-constitutional coup in Kyiv, uh, supported by the West when um, uh, anti-Russian regime came to power and uh, started the uh, policy of uh, um, uh, extermination of everything which, which, is, which was linked to Russia, starting from the Russian language, which was prohibited in Ukraine. Uh, totally, it's not just there uh, was uh, some optional or something, but it was really uh, prohibited by law. And the people who were Russian-speaking people who, who didn't agree with this anti-constitutional coup, so we're uh, targeted in a big way. The Kiev regime started genocide against those people. And uh, well, as you rightly said, actually, this is a, a conflict. This is a, you know, well, currently the uh, special military operation is conducted by Russia, is aimed basically to ensure the uh, security and saving life of all these people. Uh, of this region, Donbass region, which uh, well, is divided into two republics, which were um, on the 21st of February, uh, uh, recognized as an independent republic by Russia, have lost uh, about 14,000 people during all these events uh, and uh, without any any reaction from the Western side. So, um, of course, um, we want this operation to, uh, to, to be completed as early as possible, but uh, um, certainly until the goals of this operation is uh, are achieved. Um, we need to ensure in a long-term perspective undivided security guarantees for everyone in Europe, including uh, Ukraine, including Russia, including Donbas region, including European states. That is something which we, we were uh, asking for for many years, uh, and we were not heard. So for this, it needs to be ensured that Ukraine remains neutral, non-nuclear power. Um, the non-nuclear state not joining any military blocks and uh, uh, not deploying foreign weapons and conducting uh, uh, international military exercises on um, its uh, territory. We will work on that as long as it takes. Uh, special military operation is 
moving not uh, as fast as uh, um, one could expect it because uh, the Russian army is not targeting uh, the civilian infrastructure. Uh, so well, just uh, uh, military infrastructure of the Ukrainian army well, and uh, uh, only precise weapons are used for this purpose. And the uh, second uh, reason why it is, you know, well, um, seemingly is prolonged because uh, West is uh, continuing supporting Ukraine militarily, sending more and more troops there. And uh, um, so that complicates the situation, that complicates the negotiation process. And uh, um, what uh, is uh, also interesting, so well, NATO, well, Claiming so many times that it is not being to, uh, not to be involved in the into the conflict directly, but still there are uh, clearly you know um, um, Western officers which are now you know being prisoners there. So we know of uh, officers from the Western countries, from France, Germany, Britain, Sweden, so on and so on. So well, that, that the situation is really complicated, but we are you know moving in this direction, and we we are quite determined to to achieve the goals which were established by the president. Uh, Mr. Roman, a uh, lot of international sanctions have been uh, imposed on Russia. And uh, I won't go into the details of sanctions, but uh, overall, uh, what has been the impact of these sanctions? And uh, how do you see the impact of these sanctions uh, kind of, you know, panning out? Uh, because there is also a theory that, you know, the these sanctions are impacting uh, Russia as much as it is actually impacting the West also, those who have imposed it. So first, how how do you see you know the impact of the sanctions on Russia? What are you doing to absorb this this impact? And if, if, is there any significant impact? And how do you see the impact on the West also of these sanctions who have imposed? Well, it is, the situation is not new for us actually. Russia. Um... Uh, have been sanctioned for many years already, so I mean, <laughs> we can say that we get used to the situation, but the sanctions don't work. That uh, that is a clear, uh, a clear, you know, message that you know. Uh, at the same time, unilateral you know, sanctions are <laughs> the cost for independence and sovereignty. Um, you know, they are illegit illegitimate, imposed without any you know, solid reasons. Uh, whatever Russia is blamed for is based on uh, actually assumptions. And public opinion shaped in the West. Um, um, uh, frankly, investigations are badly needed for all these cases which Russia is blamed for. So, and uh, um, including not only what whatever whatever happens in Ukraine, but also in Syria, Skripal, and other cases, and the West is uh, refusing not only to accept the Russian proposals for these professional investigations. For example. Uh, in, in, in the case of uh, Skripals in Great Britain, we have uh, directed you know, dozens of notes to the, uh, to the British side, but actually uh, no one you know, well, has responded as yet, actually. So well, on the reasons of highly likely, so they are you know, well, well, moving for all the Western camp to impose more and more sanctions on Russia. And, um, um, it is not only the Russian proposals which are rejected, actually, they, 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 um, importantly, that uh, uh, international conventions are being violated. For example, when we take the Syrian chemical dossier, so the uh, Convention of Chemical, uh, of, um, um, chemical Weapons um, is providing so well, uh, quite a number of tools in order to investigate and you know, well, bring the uh, you know, well, uh, experts to the sites uh, uh, where some you know, well, alleged chemical attacks could have happened, but that never happened, in fact, actually. And uh, uh, on the, um, well, information, which is, uh, well, taking from the social media, whatever, so <laughs> Russia was sanctioned unilaterally. Um, and uh, that is a, you know, an obvious question. What are the values of the so-called civilized, uh, civilized West? So they need just a, a pretext for sanction to get rid of a strong competitor which doesn't uh, accept the Western hegemony. So sanctions uh, don't change the policy. It is also very clear. And, uh, um, and not supporting to resolve crisis, but lead to um, global economic instability, undermine the, uh, uh, undermine the credibility of uh, the 
the Western financial system and particularly the Western currencies. So that's why, by the way, uh, that is a, an obvious decision of the Russian leadership uh, and uh, other countries to to um, expand using of national currencies in our uh, bilateral trades. And uh, um, again, we can also say that uh, sanctions are the tools of uh, double standards. So take note that uh, such uh, things uh, Russia, Russia is blamed for without any, any proper professional investigation and proofs were totally remained unsanctioned when it came to hundreds of thousands of people, which, and most of all civilians, which were killed during the American campaigns in uh, Iraq, in Libya, in Syria, in Afghanistan. So uh, that it also comes to double standards. And uh, uh, clearly, uh, well, uh, first we need to have a look who is uh, who is most interested in such a situation, who is benefiting more. So that's that's where we are. Uh, as we have seen in the United Nations also that uh, you know when it came to uh, resolution related to this situation, so the number of countries which were supporting Russia or uh, if I may say like you allies in the this conflict, uh, and if we look at you know uh, uh, Ukraine or the Western Bloc, so uh, Russia seems to be you know uh, kind of uh, having. Uh, much lesser number of allies and uh, if i would say that probably russia appears to be kind of basically you know isolated in this whole situation so whether it is deliberate or whether it is an outcome of the you know a geostrategic situation but russia seems to be isolated so uh, uh, who are actually your allies in this war and uh, would you like to comment on this uh, issue of uh, this like why Russia is appearing to be isolated. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think here. It is a it is a globalized world, a globalized world, and it's a, a, a utopian idea to to isolate any country and which uh, with the um, where we have uh, you know, independent states like um, India, China, and others who are following their irrevocable. Uh, choice for multipolarity. We are ready to, to work with everyone uh, on the basis of equality, mutual benefit and uh, respect. And uh, uh, well, we, we clearly see that uh, there is a, uh, there are still many many partners who are willing to cooperate with us, and we are open for such cooperation. So, and uh, uh, at the same time, we see how big the pressure is uh, uh, imposed by the West on, on those who are not willing to, to follow this unipolar world and, and this dictate. And uh, um, it is uh, really the case for the international organizations where um, even in some sectoral wise uh, international organizations, uh, uh, the Western countries, countries are initiating the anti-Russian decisions and on the basis of these pretexts uh, uh, without proper, you know, um, respect for the rules of procedure. So well, they, they push forward and take uh, the majority of votes against Russia, even trying to expel Russia from uh, these international organizations. So that, that's where we are, but uh, actually we are confident that, uh, uh, well, um, for, for in, in, in some perspective, of course, uh, there would be some proper understanding it, it come um, to, to the international community that uh, it is not the way the international relations should be conducted. So, and uh, we are working with everyone. We are working with uh, our uh, partners in Asia, and uh, we are still open for dialogue uh, with the European partners. Although it, it is uh, quite difficult uh, these, these days since actually they are preoccupied with the san sanctions you know, mindset right now. So, but we, we, are, we are quite confident that uh, we will not get isolated. So, can no, I Russia, just make a small observation? Yeah. Uh, just sure. a small observation. I mean, it's, it's just a thought, you know. So, actually, when I was uh, going through the, the countries voting in the UN and I just felt that, I mean, we should really question this idea that whether the voting in the UN is the true indicator of nations supporting or going against a country. Because if we like look at the real behavior, entire South Asia, I guess, you know, they have abstained from voting. 
and uh, I, interestingly, in this matter, Pakistan and India are on the same page. Or uh, Sri Lanka abstained, Bangladesh abstained. Even in the Middle Eastern world, be it Israel, UAE, Egypt, they were not very categorical in condemning the Russian special military operation okay, or maybe quote unquote invasion of. Even in the case of Africa, there were umpteen number of articles mentioning that there's a disagreement between Africa and the West over what's happening there. Even in the Western camp, you know, we could hear many voices like in the Western European camp who were not ex precisely or in a very, I would say, you no know, straight jacketed manner following the NATO's line or the American line on this. Even in the American scholarly world, intellectual world, we can see many voices of disagreement. So I don't know, I mean, it becomes a matter of very intellectual research and questioning that whether the voting pattern in the UN is a real measure of uh, support or you know, uh, uh, some, some kind of uh, anti-Russia uh, behavior of the countries. It's a big question actually, which I guess which the scholars would find it better to explore, I guess. No? Uh, just a thought that I wanted to share, you can continue. No. Thank you. Shukriya, you know, yeah, to coffee, coffee, muskil, mamla. It is not. It is not. Um, it is not an uh, exactly. It is not an you know uh, exact indicator of uh, of uh, what country feels because each country you know takes you know independent individual approach on that. I yes. actually, um, um, we are approaching also our partners and trying to explain. What uh, what uh, what are the real situation and uh, we at the same time uh, feel that uh, the tremendous pressure is you know um, there on on almost all of the world you know to take uh, you know position as a black and white picture but it's much more complicated. Abstention may mean many things, uh, like you know well, for example some countries uh, wouldn't like to take sides uh, in this particular situation. So well and uh, probably you know. Um, uh, under this, uh, you know, pressure or um, with the uh, intention to keep dialogue open with uh, every uh, every party, so that is uh, also you know, a sort of a way to to uh, avoid taking sides. So, um, uh, but uh, um, there are two things when it comes to the voting in the international organizations, especially United Nations. So, well, first is voting, and second is explanatory notification so well explaining so well the motives of uh, the voting so well we should look uh, into that as well because that explains that explains the real you know uh, focus of each particular voting i think you know uh, this uh, 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 conflict which is going on probably uh, is going to kick off another debate also or it has already kicked off another debate on you know, the uh, uh, international, the, especially the United Nations, the way it has been structured and the role which it has been, is it merely, you know, working on paper or uh, is it freezed in the particular time frame and heavily tilted towards, you know, a certain set of nations. So probably uh, uh, this, this uh, thing India has also been talking about for quite some time and a number of other nations. Uh, the times have changed and United Nations also has to, you know, Kind of change, otherwise it will lose its relevance. And uh, so, moving on to the next question, uh, it's a little uh, sensitive one. Uh, and I'll come straight to the point. There has been some talk about, you know, there was some, uh, especially in Western media, they cried, tried to create a scare that uh, there is uh, an indication coming from the Russian establishment that there is a possibility for the use of uh, of the use of nuclear weapons in this conflict by Russia. So, if I may ask you, uh, you know, uh, in a, uh, with a straight bat, as we say in the game of cricket, that uh, what is the possibility of use of nuclear weapons by Russia at this point? Hamaro Mithaki, yeah, Kabina Yehova. Kabina Yehova. So, and uh, um, um, this is hopefully unlikely scenario. It was not Russia who started you know, talking about uh, such kind of possibility. First, we have heard about that from President Zelensky at the Munich conference, who uh, clearly said that he he wants to uh, to, to withdraw from Budapest uh, to the Budapest Agreement. And uh, it is a, by the way, 
um, uh, clear you know, danger because you know uh, well when it was the Soviet Union there are a lot of uh, you know uh, industry facilities were still there in Ukraine which are capable to 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 produce necessary equipment and necessary materials to relaunch its uh, nuclear industry so and uh, that is uh, again one of the purposes of the special military operation to avoid such scenario and then uh, well we heard such and such, you know, uh, uh, claims uh, by the British uh, side, by NATO, so well, who were, you know, well, talking about well, why not to, well, to, to deploy more nuclear weapons in the NATO region. So, well, and uh, Russia, you know, has got its nuclear doctrine, which clearly says that uh, nuclear weapons is a tool of deterrence, and, um, and as a uh, responsible nuclear power, we clearly realize uh, our uh, responsibility for maintaining strategic stability and how important it is to take a stringent control over the nuclear weapons facilities and uh, uh, the decision making process. So it's not our choice, it's not our intention to, to, to come to, to, to this point because uh, they, it is obviously clear that everyone is. Uh, Talking about that, that it, it will be no winners in this situation. Rightly said, Mr. Roman, that in such a situation, you know, there are going to be no winners. And now coming to Abhirup uh, Das, one of our uh, uh, viewers, he has he had also, you know, put up this question, but he had specifically put up a question regarding a particular region. But I'll just expand expand the scope of this question. And uh, so, how do you look at you know the global media coverage of this war and any biases you would like to point out especially i'll just bring in the latest context that you know in the city of uh, in that small town of bucha as our some people pronounce it as bucha also correct me because uh, i might be wrong in terms of pronunciation so uh, there has been claims and counter claims about you know um, the mass graves being found that the Ukrainian and the Western bloc has been saying that it's the retreating Russian uh, forces uh, who, you know, killed these uh, civilians. Whereas uh, Russia has come out with, you know, even the forensic evidence that uh, these people were actually you know, killed by the, the uh, Ukrainian uh, forces. But overall, in such a situation, we see uh, how do you look at, you know, the global because I myself had written a piece about you know, the propaganda was also going on uh, in the beginning of this conflict. So uh, it's uh, and also if you would like to comment on how do you see the coverage, especially in Indian media, of uh, this war, any particular bias? So it's a no holds barred kind of thing. So if you can do it, you can do it. If you want to do it, media, if you want to do it, because criticism is not going it will be a good learning basically for uh, the Indian media also as to how uh, 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 Russia is looking at it. <laughs> so, um, you know, media coverage from the very beginning, actually, not these uh, days, not the recent months, not the you know, previous months and the previous years, from the Western side was intentionally one sided. They, uh, they didn't intend to, to listen to us, actually. They even came to the, to the point when they have prohibited the Russian media outlets working in, 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 uh, in Europe and the Western countries. So uh, this is, again, uh, well, coming back to the values of the so-called civilized, civilized you know, West, where are these values? So, uh, the, and uh, well, as far as Indian media is concerned, well, we can understand that uh, how big is influence of the Western media is there here in India uh, and uh, certainly um, we feel the lack of uh, the other sources of information so we are trying to balance it by working very hard in the media domain here um, by what we are doing here in the in the mission by the Russian media uh, um, companies which are present here and uh, we are enjoying the freedom of speech uh, which India is uh, following and uh, this is a good example. So uh, it, uh, when, it, when it comes to the, uh, the so-called uh, war crimes uh, in Ukraine, which Russia is blamed for, so uh, again, there is a, you know, no investigation, no proofs, 
just uh, one-sided uh, -side, one -sided approach, one-sided picture, so well, not covering what happens from the other side. That happens in, in Bucha, by the way, so well, there are a lot of uh, misgivings uh, when, uh, when uh, you know, the Western partners are trying to um, um, describe the situation uh, right after this you know, situation erupted. So well, right after that, immediately they started claiming that it is Russia who did, who did so. And uh, um, um, of course, uh, uh, but uh, as far as Bucci is concerned, actually, uh, but we, we come back to this. So, and uh, when it comes to the atrocities which are committed by the Ukrainian forces, everyone keeps silent. Everyone keeps silent. But what is going on? So, well, from their side, there is a uh, extreme nationalists are uh, are doing their job. So they are using uh, uh, people with the human shields. So they are. Uh, hiding in the schools, so they're hiding in the world living areas, uh, but of course, which it becomes difficult to attack from the Russian side because actually it's not our goal. Uh, well, we still take Ukrainians as our fraternal nation, and uh, well, we don't intend to uh, harm, uh, you know, well, the, 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 these people and to, to 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 kill them because actually this is our neighborhood. We we. Uh, well, we want to live further together, so, uh, but uh, at the same time, without these uh, neo Nazis in power uh, these days. So, and uh, when it comes to, to Bucci again, so, um, well, uh, it, it happens, it happened to, <laughs> well, Russian troops have withdrawn from that region a couple of days ago. So, and right after that, we could, could see the statements made by the Bucha uh, officials and mayor uh, who, who was, you know, assuming he was okay, he was not mentioning about any problems he, he was facing in his city. So, and, uh, uh, and right after the Ukrainian, you know, forces, you know, well, entered uh, the city for the reasons of uh, cleansings. So, and uh, I don't know what happened, so well, real investigation is required, uh, and uh, actually, um, this information erupted that uh, well, the Russians did so. So, and uh, we uh, don't know the situation. We want to investigate that, and we uh, approach to the international community to to to, um, to go ahead with the, uh, you know this investigation. And uh, when it comes further back to the uh, massive disinformation campaign against Russia. So this is a, uh, we can clearly say this is an information war which we are facing. Um, so, uh, and this, uh, uh, the problem is that it happens as a, in a routine basis. It happens is um, uh, the same pattern which uh, terrorists were using in Syria. Absolutely the same. These provocations are were, were conducted by uh, white helmets by you know other terrorist you know uh, supporting organizations you know the it is a stage staged composition so uh, they, yes they need some picture which would you know well, persuade the rest of the world that that happened and that russian did so so well and that's that's all they don't need anything else so that's what what we are facing but uh, they need the truth and uh, well, the world needs the truth, but the, the Western world doesn't want this truth to uh, to be uh, uh, public. Uh, I, from my side, it's going to be the last portion, and uh, then uh, can I just can I just make an observation? Uh, 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 or apart from that, you would like to add anything further after that? Uh, to to you. Sure. Isn't that yeah. Arunji, can I just make an observation to uh, what uh, sure, sure, sure. Roman said? Yes. Uh, uh, Roman, actually, you know, it really puzzles me that uh, why there is so much lack of information regarding what's happening in Europe. Now, now I came across, across a few videos in which the right-wing Nazis of Ukraine, they were tying people to the poles and just, you know, uh, beating them black and blue. There were some videos too. Besides that, what happened in the Donbass region, the massacre, the genocide, you know, all those things, and even things which happened like uh, uh, since nineteen since nineteen ninety seven, the Budapest and Minsk agreements and those declarations, what Putin said in the Munich conference in two thousand eight, you will be shocked, you know. And I think everyone will be shocked and surprised that 
we don't have any substantial information yet. I'm sure even uh, some of the very keen observer of strategic affairs, you know, uh, they will find these things very lacking in the mainstream media discourse. You, we don't come across uh, in-depth opinion pieces on all these things. I mean, no doubt we've been, uh, we read Western sources like we read CFR, foreign policy, diplomat, everything. Definitely, I mean, we can feel that certainly uh, nothing is a completely independent media source or an independent source. Uh, good pieces are published in, even in those sources, but then we do need to have access to the alternate viewpoint. And it's absolutely surprising that we, we don't know what's happening on the other side. So I feel that somewhere it has been a, a failure on the Russian the establishment's part that they would have not been able to communicate you know, or, or like this whole uh, or the, the media diplomacy part or the public relationship part. You know, and uh, this exercise, I mean, we really want to know what happened since 1997. All what we talk about uh, the present event is the impact of Russian invasion on Chinese behavior in Indo-Pacific. So, now that is an issue, but then there is hardly no in-depth literacy about the local dynamics of the Russian special military operation or maybe invasion in Europe. Certain there were very strong local factors, and especially in particular the NATO expansion. So that's one thing. And given that, you know, do you think that there has to be some global regime of checks and balances as far as the information flow and dissemination is concerned. You know, what I can tell you, Sunil, um, uh, well, uh, uh, someone who is uh, telling that uh, there is a lack of information, either uh, the person is lazy, either it is unprofessional. So well, how can we for example, you know, uh, to deliver this information when the Russian media outlets are you know, prohibited and the people don't have access to this information. First. Second, uh, there is uh, you know, plenty of materials published in the Russian official websites like Minister of Foreign Affairs, like, you know, Kremlin. By the way, so uh, there is a, a massive DDoS attacks against this website. For example, actually, uh, we hear have some problems in accessing the Gremlin website. So it is there. So, uh, well, it was blocked. It is an information war, but what, what you are right. So, well, and I do totally agree that Russia is losing this information war because we don't have such an, you know, expertise, experience and, you know, te technologies like what the West is dominating all this, you know, well, mainstream media. So that, 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 that's what's happening. So, well, otherwise, uh, we are at the same time um, you know, quite active in the Indian uh, media domain here from the mission. So uh, we are also uh, uh, publishing a lot of things in our information resources. We are approaching the experts and expert center centers and you know, uh, official agencies individually to deliver this information. The point is whether you are, if you are interested in you know, getting into these details, you can really follow what, what are these explanations are. So uh, if not, of course, sir, this is a, you know, um, mainstream understanding from the West, they, they don't need the Russian point of view. Well, and uh, as far as what uh, uh, happens in India, that uh, uh, open every newspaper. So what uh, you can see at the pages uh, uh, which are dedicated to the international affairs. So uh, reprinted messages from uh, New York Times, from Associated Press, from Reuters, from everywhere. So, of course, they are delivering to the Western point of view, but you have not so much, you know, uh, correspondents uh, who are working, uh, you know, well, in, in the countries in Russia, for example. No one is there just, well, they started moving only when the separation started and then they, uh, you know, well, well, decided to apply for the visas and whatever. So, well, some of them are already there, but the voice is still very slow. Uh, in this regard. So this is a real problem. This is a real problem. So well, we try to, to balance that. So well, and that's why, by the way, I should be very grateful for your program, for your initiative to talk about that so that we could discuss it in more detail so that uh, well, probably uh, our, our conversation would really be, you know, well, circulated or maybe some heard by those who are interested in yes. Thank you. I, th thank I you. think you thank know, you. this is a very interesting because, you know, being a journalist, so now, you know, it's like, uh, uh, so, uh, I'll tell you the reason so, why, why I was so moved by this question and the, or Roman's observation is because 
India has been a major victim of this narrative warfare, you know, especially on the Kashmir issue. Entire Western narrative is so biased against us you know, that one cannot imagine. I mean, government of India, if arrest Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, the man who has been responsible for umpteen number of murders in Kashmir, then on the next, the very next day, you will see Washington Post, New York Times, full of things that you no know, a freedom fighter has been arrested. You know? If there is a problem of you know something like Burhan Wani is oh. you know encountered like he's killed in an encounter, he is the person who gave a call for establishing caliphate in Kashmir, and right after that, you no, know, you get to hear news outlets shouting at the top of their voices that a rebel or a freedom fighter was arrested. I think I believe we should we should have a we should have an interesting and separate you know the uh, program where I will also Definitely. share share my you know the the trade secrets and the inside details of what happens in the news room. That's India, true. all I can say is, you know, uh, one of my first editors, he gave me what you call the guru mantra of journalism. He said that, you know, uh, all stories are plants. We publish only authentic plants. So, <laughs> okay. so it's basically, somebody's, so it's it's actually, and uh, Mr. Roman, just just uh, 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 an observation. See, what, what's happening is that in media, you need basically uh, there is a push factor and there is a pull factor. So you know, in Indian media, uh, uh, if you are expecting, uh, and media is always this, media people who basically you know are not lazy, they go out and you know they do better things in uh, in terms of हमारे यहाँ यही कहते हैं. So uh, journalists will not take this. You know, uh, you may call them lazy or irresponsible, but uh, they generally don't go to the websites and whatever comes into their mailboxes, whatever is being pushed to them, you know, so they generally tend to cling to that and they want basically ready-made material. And I'm not talking only about Indian journalists. It's across the board. This is a basic, uh, one of the basic tenets of this uh, of profession. So I think, I think uh, if you want to put your viewpoint, uh, if you want to put across your viewpoint, I think you have to rely more on the push factor and rather than the pull factor, but we can have a conversation about this uh, later on. But uh, last question. Uh, uh, and just and before, adding to what, yeah, yeah. Uh, just what Arunji said, you know, uh, I, I feel that you know, if good quality opinion pieces, analytical pieces about, you know, the, or this other side of what's happening in Europe or the Russian perspective, if they come out in the mainstream media, I guess the international relations scholars or the young students, they are more likely to read opinion pieces. We, I mean, Sometimes only the researchers, hardcore researchers, they access the ministry websites, but uh, people prefer to read opinion pieces. That's uh, just a suggestion. That's it. Over to you, Arun. Uh, I'm sorry for okay, uh, like, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Jahan Tak. Yeah, Mr. Roman. Jahan Tak. Yeah. Kashmir ka So, yeah, yes. cool. Gharat or Pakistan ki bich dvi pakshi Yeah. There is no, uh, there is no scope for interference and there is no scope for committing from outside. Especially for those who then don't care about the situation, they, who don't care about getting into details about the history. So well, we have a clear understanding in Russia about that. So well, we are we are not going to comment whatever happens. So well. So, uh, Mr. Truman, uh, and I I'm asking this question with a caveat uh, uh, because it, what needs to be very transparent about it. Uh, though I just wanted to ask about, you know, how do you look at India's role ever since this conflict started, but I'm just adding another question to it because I had a conversation with the Polish ambassador this morning. So, you know, as a journalist, you have to talk to all sides. So, and I asked him the same question. Of course, I don't expect your answer to be influenced by that. Uh, and the question is that, you know, there are a lot of uh, thousands of Indian students who were studying in uh, Ukraine. And now it doesn't seem that, you know, in near future, they'll be able to complete their education there. So uh, there was initially some talk from Poland that, uh, you know, they would be, uh, uh, they, they would allow the Indian students to continue there. But the conversation which I had, so, you know, there is no formal commitment as such uh, now. So uh, if we talk about Russia, so, do you think that uh, is there anything categorical you would like to say or share about that those Indian students who left their studies in between uh, after the conflict in Ukraine started? So uh, is there a possibility of uh, these students continuing their studies and completing their studies in uh, uh, Russia? 
So this is uh, the last question from my side, and then if there's anything else, uh, Abhinav can ask after this, and then we can wrap. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron. This is a, a quite a you know uh, quite a situation uh, where Russia is also um, trying to offer its good services to the Indian students who had to leave Ukraine and to stop their studies. So um, the advantage is in this situation that the programs are, in many cases, are coinciding for quite a similar. And uh, um, I know that uh, our uh, line agencies are in touch with each other, and we are working with the uh, you know, uh, uh, specialized uh, students' associations, and you know, really delivering this message that it is. Uh, possible and uh, probably in case by case basis because uh, there are various options. Uh, there are some explanation required in terms of uh, payments. So and uh, um, because of you know <laughs> Russia is you know well isolated from the Western uh, financial system, so well, we need to work out something, something new, something else, and uh, you know uh, what we are doing with India, particularly. So and we are very flexible. Very, very flexible in this regard. So I know that the Russian universities are ready to receive these students. So uh, the conversation in this regard, so well, not to, you know, well, misguide on the young people who are keen to continue their studies. So uh, there is a conversation on the proper level and between the proper, you know, organizations involved about how can we ensure that. So and um, we know that there is a big interest, and uh, all, from our side, uh, there is also a big interest to offer our good services in order to uh, uh, to, uh, to provide this opportunity for the students because it's uh, it's, it's a very important uh, thing because it's a very uh, um, you know, humanitarian. There is a big humanitarian component. And uh, um, certainly, certainly, it would be uh, we would be glad to support these families, to support these students, so so that they could uh, get the proper education and uh, continue their professional life. So a link to this region, either Russia or Ukraine. So uh, because uh, well, we have a lot of uh, opportunities uh, linked to the Russian language, for example, even some. The multilateral institutions are being, uh, you know, communicated in Russian, like, for example, Shanghai Bank Cooperation Organization, like the Eurasian Economic Union, which well, uh, India is uh, going to to enter with the free trade uh, area agreement, and uh, some other uh, opportunities. By the way, uh, there are a lot of uh, new options are opening up these days uh, since the Western companies are withdrawing from the Russian market, so there are uh, a huge vacant places in order to uh, to be offered to the Indian companies in order to come to this market and to expand its business presence at a very favorable opportunity for the um, Indian people, Indian businessmen, Indian students to, uh, you know, well, to, to go ahead with these options. Avinavji, you can, I think, you know, take over. I think Karsten wants to ask something also. Yes, it was um, in connection with the last thing which, which Roman mentioned that opportunities are arising. And I think it, a lot of troubles are happening in the world and that is always, always the case when the world is changing and the world is changing in dramatic ways right now. And I, I, I believe that it is very important both for Russia but also for all the rest of the world including very much India but also those 25 countries in Africa which did not vote against Russia. Uh, also for uh, those very big important countries like Mexico and Argentina and, and Brazil which have not sanctioned Russia. That, that this is an opportunity. I think this was absolutely the right word from, 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 from Russia to hear that there is a great opportunity in this. And that we have this comes on top of a of a of a long time development that the the West is descending in power and the non West is ascending. So there is a strategic opportunity for Russia to to catch the train of the non West in a more decisive way, 
because now the West is cutting off Russia in all kinds of, of, of ways. And Russia is becoming a big uh, market now for all those uh, products and companies which were Western and which are now leaving. This leads me to my question here to, to uh, Roman Babushkin. Uh, Russian diplomacy, uh, is Russian diplomacy now uh, reorienting enough? I, I know you are reorienting, but, but are you doing it forcefully enough from trying to, to, to run over after, after all these uh, Western uh, cars which are just driving away and reorienting your diplomatic forces uh, towards places like uh, India, uh, Africa, Latin America and so on? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, the reality of uh, today when um, well, <laughs> when some doors are you know, getting closed. So of course uh, we all move naturally to those doors which are open. So uh, and we, it, it brings us back to the questions of uh, attempts to isolate Russia, which uh, seemingly is a quite a challenging task for the Western. <laughs> countries since uh, we feel there is a big interest, uh, there is a big history in our relations with the Asian, African and Latin American countries. Of course, there are some long uh, term oriented projects which are being implemented and we feel this commitment from their side to continue implementation of this project. And of course, so and uh, 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 in Russia, we, we joke that uh, second place is never empty. So and, uh, <laughs> It's it's a, uh, 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 in every job there is some sense of reality and certainly we are very open for these opportunities. Uh, uh, so and uh, uh, what is really important then, many of these countries are ready to trade more in national currencies because uh, the problems uh, are there with the um, U.S. dollars, with the euros, which are becoming the tools of sanctions and where your assets can be um, any day frozen and uh, stolen. <laughs> What happens in in our case, uh, for example, not only our case, but uh, ours uh, uh, also. And of course, you are quite right. I do support your you know, point that uh, probably we be we are facing in a very special moment. It, it is a timely, timely initiative to to go more aggressively to to deal with uh, with this opportunity and to involve more you know partners from other countries as well who are not supporting sessions so who are ready to bypass them. To preserve their legitimate national interest, to trade equally, to maintain equal partnership, and for for the for the benefit of our nations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roman and uh, Avinav. Uh, just two quick questions. questions. That's it. Okay. Uh, first is so, uh, Roman. Do you see uh, visualize the beginning of the de-dollarization of the world? And secondly, related to this, so especially. Uh, if the dollar declines, Indian tech companies, you know, uh, the mostly the IT companies, you know, uh, they kind of suffer. So, do you feel that you know, I mean, Indian tech companies uh, can have more opportunities and you know, exploration in the Russian markets? That's my first question. And uh, secondly, uh, your take on the ongoing peace process in which India, Israel, and Turkey are playing a very crucial role. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, well, that, that brings us back to the previous question as well. So, uh, all opportunities are there. So, well, and the IT uh, area is very much in demand in Russia these days. And of course, we know about the Indian expertise, not, not only in this area, but also automobile industry, you know, civil aviation, um, you know, shipbuilding, um, uh, agriculture, pharmace pharmaceuticals also. Well, we, we know that. Um, there is intention from the uh, Indian pharma sector to expand its presence in Russia. And there are some companies already working on. So, and uh, I think that uh, that is something which needs to be, you know, uh, pushed forward. And uh, well, the private initiative would welcome. Uh, at the same time, uh, so um, you know, there is a huge sense of uncertainty for for the private sector right now because. So, but first, we need to uh, to uh, to finalize the arrangements which are related to the. Uh, our financial systems, our financial interaction, which is not linked to SWIFT and you know uh, the Western currencies. So as soon as it is uh, being finalized, as soon as it is, the system is ready, and of course I think that we will see more interest from that part. 
So as far as negotiations is concerned, very interesting thing I would like to share with you that uh, where we um, touched upon the situation in Bucha, for example. The, uh, another reason why it happened right now, we can guess that, that you know, uh, it coincided with the recent, uh, you know, round of talks between Russia and Ukraine, when we uh, almost approached the agreement about what we are discussing about neutrality, about, you know, non-participation in military blocs, uh, etc. What so uh, that's exactly what Russia wants in this situation. So and uh, <clears throat> well, right after that, situation in Bucha happened. So it looks like it looks like you know well uh, those who are consulting the Ukrainian side so well, are intentionally diverting attention from these talks. So well, you know that to to keep this conflict ongoing. So well, and now. We can see from the news. I was just before joining this program. I was, you know, uh, trying to trace the news from the TV, and actually there are some statements that Ukraine wants to withdraw from peace negotiations. So that that happens coincidentally, and of course, so uh, that is part of the uh, you know maybe bigger bigger issue which is uh, there. So well, the Ukrainian uh, side uh, is not of. Uh, of a control of itself. So, and as far as Indian role is concerned, uh, India is already playing uh, quite a big and important role. Apka bhak jo ap lene wale hain ye bahut bara aur mahatvapurna hai. Ye hamara vishwas hai. So, and uh, because uh, um, uh, apka uh, apke niche swatantar, swatantar ye. Uh, speaks for itself. So, so Tantra balanced, and uh, there is a strong, strong feeling, strong sense of deep understanding of the situation from the Indian side and uh, unacceptability of the unilateral sanctions. And we appreciate that position. We appreciate that position. So, and uh, in any way, as uh, you know, uh, you remember our Foreign Minister Vladrov was here recently. And he clearly said that um, so well, in case of India uh, wants to support this peace process based on the uh, universal principles of international relations, when it would lead to the de-escalation of the conflict in the Eastern Europe, if it would lead to the um, undivided security for everyone. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, this support would be uh, much welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, uh, Abhinavji, we can, uh, you know, formally wrap it up. And uh, yes. if, uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Roman, thank you so much. I think uh, we're going to uh, uh, have another conversation, you know, probably, uh, hopefully, this conflict will end soon, as you said, that Russia wants to end it as soon as possible. In fact, everybody wants to. Uh, and it as soon as possible. So hopefully it ends soon, and then we can have another conversation about you know the lessons which have been learned from this uh, uh, conflict. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, sparing your time and answering all the questions and sharing your deep insight. And आपकी uh, हिंदी बहुत अच्छी है and और आपकी हिंदी सुनकर बहुत अच्छा लगा. ये तो इतनी अच्छी नहीं. अगली बार हम हिंदी बातचीत करेंगे और आप लोगों को सब लोगों को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आपसे मिलकर बहुत बड़ी खुशी हुई एंड थैंक यू फॉर ऑल आवर व्यूअर्स एंड द टेक टीम बेसिकली व्हिच मेड इट पॉसिबल थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड वी विल मीट वेरी सून थैंक यू ऑन अनदर इंटरव्यू ऑन अनदर प्रोग्राम डन बाय द उसानास फाउंडेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू एंड वंस अगेन यू नो वेदर एंड जेंटलमैन वुड लाइक टू अपोलॉजाइज फॉर द इनकन्वीनियंस so well the, the delay of the of the conversation so well um, i hope you you understand and i really appreciate your patience and you know attention it was my pleasure thank you namaskar thank you pure thank Manini. you very much roman arunanji thank you very much for joining us today i would, I would like to thank yeah. all the participants for joining us today uh, i can see a few more questions but we are running short of time so i mean we i really apologize that we cannot take the, any more questions to, for today's event but certainly we'll have many more events and uh, i request thank all you. of you to join our future events and participate and it was a very interesting very informative and enlightening discussion once again thanks to all of you thanks roman thanks arunji and uh, Roman, your Hindi is really amazing. You have inspired us. You know, I guess we should start speaking 
more in Hindi. I, th that's for the Delhi circuit. You know. I stay in Udaipur. Here we speak a lot of Hindi, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.